uh, Matt said yesterday. So he mentioned that um, pretty much after Monday morning, we're going to be done with the CSS coverage. Now, some of you may be excited about that. Some of you may be, you know, a little bummed out, but um, unit one is when we hit a lot of our CSS. We find that CSS is something that most people, and you guys are probably, you know, already mindful of this. You can, you can look it up. A lot of people just inherently enjoy CSS because it's very visual and they just kind of get their hands in the sandbox anyway. That being said, we do try to cover like some, you know, the greatest hits of CSS and things that will be very valuable to you guys going forward. Um, just a quick poll of the crowd, who like as of today, even though we haven't hopped into like any backend stuff and you may not have had any backend experience with databases or server side type of code, who as of now is thinking like, I'm not really into front end, I don't think I wanna be a front end developer, probably gonna be more back endy. Okay, a couple of hands. Now those hands may increase as we actually get into back end code and something may click and you may be like, wow, I didn't even know that I had a, um, a proclivity for this or you know, some sort of talent for this. All that being said, if you are a back end developer and you have like, if you maintain like 20% of what we covered, you are going to be a rock star if you can communicate in any way with the front end developer. And I like to think of it like, um, let's say in Major League Baseball. So in the American League, you have pitchers and they are also required to go to bat, right? They have to hit. Now, you don't hire a pitcher for their batting average. You just hire a pitcher because their talent, what you're paying them millions to do is just to pitch really, really well. Now, if they can get up to bat and let's say that they hit the ball into play maybe like one and a half or two times out of 10, that is a total bonus. You didn't hire them for that talent, but if they can like not fail eight of 10 times, um, excuse me, if they cannot fail two of 10 times um, on average, then that's totally great. And I think it's the same thing with backend development. That being said, we're gonna cover CSS today, tomorrow morning, and then Monday morning, and then we're gonna be out of the woods with CSS. So today should be fun. We're going to accept stupid designated hitter stuff, absolutely. So today we're gonna to co uh, cover a couple of topics. Uh, this morning we're gonna talk about CSS sprites, which are really, really interesting. We're also gonna talk about a little bit of responsive design and fonts as well. So let's get into it. Um, here are our lesson objectives, pretty straightforward. This morning we're gonna take a look at loading fonts into your application and also talk about what a CSS uh, sprite sheet is. Has anyone played around with sprites before? or knows what sprites are. Okay, cool, a couple of hands. Well, if you haven't played around with sprites, you're in for a treat. When I like learned about sprites and started playing around with them, they just make so much sense. And I think it's such a great tool to be aware of. The first thing I wanna do is let's go ahead and set up our environment. So this morning we're gonna move at a pretty good clip. So I'm gonna demonstrate some stuff and then you guys are gonna have an opportunity to actually practice it. Um, and so let's go ahead and get our environment set up, which I just put into Slack. What I'd like for you guys to do is go into your student labs folder in the repo for today. So week three, day four, go ahead and make a directory and call it fonts lesson. So this is going to be where you put kind of your sample code that you'll be following along, following along with me, um, CD into that folder create an index.html file, then create three new folders, images, fonts, and CSS. Then create the CSS file by touching that path, and then open the file structure, or open the entire folder in Atom, and I put a screenshot of what your file structure should look like with that screenshot. And then go ahead to get started and scaffold out that basic HTML scaffolding that Adam makes really, really easy, right? So you can type in HTML and hit tab, and it'll pretty much do all the heavy lifting for you. So let's take a few minutes and do that. Give me a thumbs up in Slack when you finished all six of those bullet points. I'm gonna share my screen, because I've, I've done some of this, but I wanna go ahead and get up to speed as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen while we do this together. I'm going to try something different today. I really, I, I'm, I think we as an instructional team, like this, the, 
mechanics of remote teaching can be challenging and we're always trying to figure out like the most efficient and the best way to do this. So one thing I'm going to try for some of the lesson this morning is I downloaded an Atom package called uh, Browser Plus. And maybe some of you guys already have this included or you've played around with it. But what it does is it will open a simulated version of a browser within your Atom window. So I'm going to try this this morning. I would love to get you guys' feedback if, if this is helpful, if you like it, if you'd rather just see like the full screen. But I'm going to try this this morning and see if it, if it helps you guys out a little bit. Um, yeah, so let me go ahead and create my scaffolding here. <clears throat> I'll put my link to my style sheet, which is going to be in CSS styles. And I'll just put in like some, actually, I'm going to go ahead and create a P tag just to test this out. So I'm just going to put like, here is some paragraph content within my P tag. And I will create a rule. So we're going to create a rule for our P tags to start here shortly. I'll just put a color of uh, red just to make sure that everything's wired up correctly. And then I can go right here and refresh this. And what am I missing? So the index is loading. There we go. So if you need some help with the uh, href path for your CSS link, be sure to put this dot forward slash at the beginning. So remember that a dot is referring to the um, directory that you're currently in. So it looks like you'll probably need a dot there. So dot forward slash CSS forward slash uh, styles dot CSS. Cool, and I see three thumbs up so far. So Adam asks in Slack, will this include Font Awesome? Uh, we are not going to cover Font Awesome specifically uh, today, but if that's something that you're interested in, um, certainly happy to chat about it or go over it, you know, at a break time or um, during lab time or something. So. Cool. Let me make my Adam window a little larger here. So again, the, the whole point of this is to try to make this as user-friendly as possible for you guys. Cool, eight thumbs up. We are getting there. So I, so we're videotaping, videotaping, good Lord. We are uh, screen casting, capturing the screencast of this video. Everything, all of this code is going to be saved in the instructor's example folder in um, today's repo. I'm happy to slack out code if you need it, so just hit me up. Um, but you guys, should, you guys should have access to everything that we're doing this morning. What is DS Store? Um, so DS Store is a hidden file that uh, is for Mac OS. And it's something that Finder uses locally. So when you're looking at the folder containers locally, if you open up something on your desktop, it just keep, it, it keeps track of kind of the versions of the files, what files are contained within that container. .ds store is an excellent candidate that you'd want to put in a git ignore file. You definitely don't want a .ds store up in your GitHub repo because um, for lack of a more tactful way, it just doesn't really look good if you have like DS store up in your GitHub repo because there's zero reason for it to be up there. Um, so a good rule of thumb is to put that in a git ignore, particularly when we get to full project, um, full project, you know, full stack applications. I just want to take a quick second. So we've got two thumbs up. Let me address like a, on a bigger scale this. So, and I'm not picking on Richie at all, but Richie says might be a dumb question. So I, I've seen this a couple of times, like this may be dumb or this may be a stupid question. So this is just my opinion, but I feel like there's two types of questions. There's like really smart questions and there's maybe um, not so smart questions. So what is the difference? Well, when you get out to work at a dev shop and such, 
An example of a smart question is, let's say that you're given a task, and let's say that it's not working properly. Now, an example of a smart question is the following. Before you go and ask like your senior person or your mentor, did you Google that issue? Is it something that you can Google before you ask the question? Can I like tap like three buddies around me on the shoulder, some of my colleagues and ask them before I go to my senior person? Um, did I check my console log to see if there's an error, if, if it's an error type situation? Did I go into my server logs? If this error is like a needle in a haystack, can I somehow maybe even like point into the direction or the quadrant in the haystack that this error is emanating from before I ask someone to answer this question for me? So those are examples of smart questions because when you get into the field, we all want to work at a shop where I can continue to learn and get good mentoring and they're gonna pet me on the back and you know gently you know, groom me in the nest. And that's all well and good, but that's not really the reality. When you go in for an interview, they're not asking, they're not looking to see if you're smart and you know everything. I guarantee you underneath the hood, what they're thinking is, is this person going to save me time? Meaning, are they going to ask me questions all day long? Are they going to take away from my workflow because I'm answering other people's questions all day? Um, I feel like at dev shops, you're going to get like, 10, 20, 30 of like goodwill, like question, get out of jail free cards. And you wanna be very strategic about when you use those. So those are examples of smart questions. Um, the other like type of question I feel is if you're just not paying attention. <laughs> so like if you're in a meeting and you're like on your phone or you're on Facebook and you just like that question was just answered and you just completely beef it. So that'd be an example of like a, a not great question. But um, yeah, I would just, you know, just in general, when you get out into the field, um, you know, give it the college try. See if it's something that you can Google quickly. All right, cool. So we've got 15, 16 folks. Let's, let's move forward. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take about five minutes. I'm going to walk through a couple of steps, and then you guys are going to be able to do exactly what I just walked through, and I'll give you some instructions in Slack. So if you just want to hang tight for a minute, and I'll walk through how we implement fonts into our application. Um, so instead of using something like Google Fonts, which we'll get to shortly, let's say that we want to download the font files directly. Um, maybe we purchase a font, or maybe we can find a free font online that we really like, and we want to include that into our app. Let's see how we do that. So I'll put, these, uh, put this into Slack, kind of the next steps here. So, why would we want to load fonts into our website directly? Well, up until recently, fonts on the web were limited to what was installed on a computer. So we know that web safe fonts, um, there's only, I don't know, I'd have to look it up, maybe like 20 web safe, safe fonts. I think that's about right. Um, so maybe we don't want, you know, Times New Roman. We want something a little cooler. So maybe we want to implement a font. Or I think there's a very lucrative market for folks that are really good at designing fonts. Um, make a pretty good living that way. Number two, you can only depend on users having system fonts that were installed on every machine by default. So if someone's looking at your site on a PC, on maybe some sort of mobile device or an iPad or a Mac, um, you can't be sure that the font is gonna be consistent across those devices. So including the specific font with your application is a good way to, to maintain consistency. And number three, now you can load fonts into your website so each user doesn't have to install them manually. So I, I guess this is very applicable like to the Adobe um, Photoshop and maybe even Adobe Reader days. I remember um, it wasn't a, a few years ago that sometimes I would try to open a PDF or maybe if I'm trying to, um, I know here internally with GA, occasionally you know, we have a uh, kind of a style guide. So when we're doing workshops and presentations, there's a recommended font layout that we use. And I remember when I first started like building decks and editing decks, uh, I didn't have the like recommended GA font. And so that was a little bit of a headache to install that so that like Adobe or even Preview could recognize those fonts and render the stuff correctly. So these are a couple of strategies, well, a couple of reasons that maybe we want to include a specific font so we can be assured that these fonts are going to look the same across any browser, any type of device. So how do we use a font file?
Well, step one is that you or a designer can download or create actual font files and then reference them in your CSS files. Now, we're not going to walk through how to create uh, CSS fonts today, but I am going to download a font and include it into my app, and then we can see what, what that process looks like. I'm going to go to this first bullet point here. It's a site called Font Squirrel. Pretty interesting name. Um, let me share my screen. I'm going to share my full screen so you can watch me as I do this. So let me stop my share. And if you guys want to go to Font Squirrel also, uh, you guys will be doing this in a, in a few minutes when we get to exercise time. But here's Font Squirrel. So Font Squirrel is just one example uh, of where you can download some fonts. Some of these are free, some of these are paid, etc. But Oh, and one other tip, I put it in kind of the exercise instructions. Make sure that when you're looking at this, you probably want for this exercise, you probably want to find a font that's free and you want to find one that doesn't say off site. So off site is going to direct you to some other third party website and it may not be very user friendly for this exercise. So to get started, I'm going to, I think this second one, we'll just click on this Source Sans Pro. So I want to download this, it looks cool. I wanna put it into my app. So I'm gonna click this download OTF link. And you guys probably noticed that here at the very bottom of my browser. Let me bring this up in case you can't see it because of Zoom. But it downloaded a zip file. So a zip file, if you're unaware, it's kind of a compressed, minified version of whatever data we just downloaded. It makes it a little smaller, it's easier to transfer that information. So when I download that zip file, it downloaded to my downloads, uh, downloads folder. I can double click on that, and then it'll open up the actual folder. Now when I open this up, it looks like I have several different varieties of this font, right? So there's, um, there's bold, there's extra light, there's, um, maybe this is italics here, this IT, semi-bold, regular. So there's sev several different varieties. Now, the quick and dirty way for me to do this with Atom, and if for no other reason, this is my favorite feature of Atom that Sublime Text doesn't have, and that's the ability to just drag files and folders right here on the left-hand side of Atom when you see your structure. It, it, it's such a great feature. Um, it may be cheating a little bit, but it's just, I don't understand why Sublime Text can't get it together and let you do this. I'm going to grab this IT. Let's see what this is. I'm just going to guess that maybe this is italics. I hope it is. So uh, when you guys do this, just grab one of these fonts, and I'm going to drag this into my fonts folder here. So that's why we created this fonts folder. Again, just to have a separation of concerns. And I'm going to put this one font within that folder. Cool. So I've downloaded the font. Um, I have some content in this P tag. And then I have some rules for this P tag. So let's actually tell my application that I want to import that font from my fonts folder. The way that we can do that is here in our styles.css. And I'm going to use something called font face with this little at symbol, if you guys can see that here. So this at symbol is a way that we can import other stuff into our CSS pipeline. It's just the nomenclature that we use with CSS. So font face, I'm going to open up a rule here. So for font face, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell CSS what I want the name of this font family to be. Now, this font family can really be called anything you want. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to call this um, mark font just for sample purposes. Now, ideally, best practice, you probably want to name this font exactly what you downloaded, just to be consistent. But the first thing you want to do is give it the name that you're going to use throughout your different rules and selectors in your style sheet. The second thing that we need to do is tell our CSS where to actually find this font file. So we're going to do an SRC with this URL. And then within the uh, single ticks or quotes, it doesn't matter, I'm going to put the path of my file. So it's going to be in my fonts folder. And I'm using these two dots, kind of this relative path, because right now, my styles.css, I'm in my CSS folder, right? 
So I need to do dot dot to get back up to the parent folder, then go down to my fonts folder, and then I'm gonna put the name of the font file right here, which is source sans pro dash I, capital I T dot O T F. Cool, that looks pretty good. Um, now the final thing I wanna do is I wanna go into my P tag rule and obviously I want to declare what font family I want this P tag to be. So here I'm gonna put my font family and the font family is gonna be Mark font because that's just the alias that I gave that font name. And then if I refresh my browser over here, click refresh and there we go. So it's not super dramatic, but it is italicized like, like we guessed. Um, so it changed the font. And again, the great benefit of this is that now this font that I imported, when I push this file to uh, this folder, my app to GitHub, when I host it somewhere, um, this font is gonna be downloaded with all of the other files. And so I can be assured that whoever is uh, looking at my app, that they're gonna have access to this font. And so I don't have to worry about something not rendering consistently across browsers. Cool, so that's how we import a font using a separate file. So now it's an exercise time, so you guys can do this yourself. And I'll put these instructions into Slack. Any questions uh, before we go into a little bit of a lab time here? And I'm not gonna put you guys in a breakout rooms, so we'll just kind of do this live and in person. <laughs> I'm gonna stop my share. Um, any questions about that? I'm happy to slack out the code that I have to get you guys started. Um, cool, okay, so let's take five or six minutes. Um, if you guys wanna go to font squirrel and find some other font to play around with, and um, I'll be here if you need any help, but let's take five or six minutes and see if you guys can implement a font in your application. Mark, do we have to put that in a new font face tag or can it just be under the source of the last one? Uh, yes, you do have to put it in a different font face tag. That, yeah, that's a really good point. So maybe you want to import three, four, or five different fonts. Um, each one of those fonts would require a separate at font face rule. Yeah, great question. Yeah, because each font face rule is going to have a different uh, name or an alias for that font. So you need separate, uh, separate font face rules. Hey, Mark. 
I think I'm having issues linking my CSS to my HTML. Doesn't okay. seem to work for me. Okay. You want to share your screen? We'll take a look. Sure. There it is. So does someone want to help um, help Sorella out? What what is she missing? Where is he? What is it? Yeah, it looks like Kelly uh, is helping you out there. Oh. Okay, thank you. Let's see if that works. Yay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Let me ask you guys another question um, while we're waiting on some more thumbs up. So when I downloaded that font, uh, I had maybe nine or 10 different varieties of that font. Does someone want to come on mic and maybe describe the strategy? Why didn't I just dump that entire folder into my app? You know, why not just, put all the fonts in my pipeline. What, what would be um, a strategy or a reason not to do that or to do that? How would I think about putting those fonts into my application? I, I'm not sure that I know the answer, but I was thinking on that too, because I know a teeny tiny bit about font and font design and font manipulation. I mean, a tiny bit. And um, I know that taking a font and modifying it um, is not very good usually. You want to take the purposely modified font that was purposely done by the creator, so like the italic version, rather than taking the normal version and making it italic. So I was thinking through that, and I was thinking that I would drop all of them in there and name them like I picked Quicksand. So I would call them QS Bold, QS Bold Italic, QS Italic, whatever. And that way I could find them um, better uh, and rather than using like the CSS built-in italic bold. But for all I know, the CSS built-in italic bold might actually properly refer to the proper font. I, I don't really know. But those are my thoughts. Let me, let me rephrase, Jason, while I have you. Um, so let's say, so I had like 10 fonts in that folder, but I know I'm only going to use one. Oh, if you're only going to use one, then you don't want to have the website downloading too much stuff and slowing it down. Yeah. Yeah, if I've got like 10 fonts and I know I'm only going to use one of those, like I don't want to sully my download or my application speed by just dumping those nine fonts that I know I'm not going to use. It's just extra cruft. Um, there's no reason to put it in there. So yeah, so in this example, I'm just dumping the one that I know that I'm going to use. Yeah, it really looks like she's on the right track there. Cool. All right, got uh, nine more thumbs up. So let's take another minute or two and then we're gonna move forward to uh, Google Fonts, which I imagine, imagine several of you guys have played around with that before. Cool, 13 thumbs ups. All right, 14, 15, six. okay, cool. All right, cool, I'm gonna move forward. Um, actually, let's do this just for funsies. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you have played with Google Fonts and you know how to implement them into your application. Who feels comfortable with Google Fonts? Okay, so I see Zach, he was the first thumb. Zach, let, I'm just gonna throw this out there. Would you be comfortable sharing your screen and maybe walking us through implementing a Google Font into your app? Do you feel comfortable doing that? Ooh. <laughs> uh, sure, I, I can try. I, I, don't, remember. I don't wanna put you on the spot, I just thought. Don't blow it. Well, I haven't done it for a while, but I, I want to say it's pretty straightforward. They give you little tutorials in there um, yeah. about where to copy and paste things. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, if you, if you want me to. 
Yeah, let, let's just try this. I, I just want to like keep it keep it light. Um, I'm going to put the link to Google Fonts in Slack. So Zach, why don't you go ahead and click on that, and the rest of the class, please do so as well. And let's walk through. Uh, there's only a couple of steps involved, but let's walk through throwing Google Fonts into our application. It's going to be very similar. Actually, it's going to be easier than what we did with downloading the font. Um, so Zach, maybe if you want to click on Google Fonts and uh, just go ahead and share your screen when you're ready, if you're comfortable, and um, yeah. teach us, oh wise one. Oh no. <laughs> this could be an excuse, but it looks like they've changed their layout. I assume it'll be just as easy though. Yeah. Yeah, this does look new, huh? They looks like they did some material design on their own stuff. This looks yeah. Cool. So it looks like I have kind of a, a shopping cart now. If you hit plus, it says one family selected down at the bottom here. Yeah, that's really cool. No. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so why don't you, um, so for those of you, if this is your first time, so this is the Google Fonts um, kind of homepage or website. So. Google Fonts, you don't necessarily download these fonts. In fact, I don't think you can download these fonts. All of these fonts are accessed via CDN. Um, does someone want to put CD, uh, I'll put this into Slack. What is CDN? And I think I know what Jason put in there two days ago. <laughs> Close, yeah. Uh, I think technically it's content delivery network. Um, maybe they do say distribution somewhere, but yeah, so the idea is that these fonts are hosted somewhere remotely on Google servers, and we're gonna put a link to the URL to download the actual font information remotely. Now, remember like we discussed on Tuesday, that one downside to this is if you have slow Wi-Fi, maybe if your user has slow Wi-Fi, maybe if you're on, again, a Southwest flight, partying up in those wrinkle-free khaki dockers. Maybe you don't want to pay for the Wi-Fi, and so your font isn't going to render, obviously, because you don't have it locally. So those are a couple of things to consider with Google Fonts. Um, another thing to consider that Zach will show us in a minute, Google Fonts also shows you um, how long these fonts are going to take to load into your application. Because some of these fonts have more options than others. Some are just more um, data uh, heavy or, or they take more space than others. So it'll actually give you a little gauge on how slow or how much slower this is going to take your application to load because it has to go out and grab the data for these font files and such. Cool. So Zach, let's just pick one of these at the top or, or actually just pick whatever tickles your fancy here. Yeah, sure. So I grabbed this uh, Open Sans Condensed. I kind of like how thin it is. So uh, to select it, I just hit the, the plus sign here. Cool. And then I can add it to my cart down below. So it looks like I can probably add a few different ones if I also add this Laura. And then I can open up the font menu down here. Um, Okay, so I just removed that. So then once you have your font families, to it looks like to get the link to paste into your code, you hit this little arrow here. I'll hit that. Then it brings me to this page, and this is kind of what I was referencing earlier. It kind of breaks everything down about what to do from here. Um, so to embed these fonts into a web page, copy this code into the head of your HTML document. Yep. And look at, the, uh, if you guys check out, so this is the standard way to load it. You can put a link into your HTML or that at import, you can also add this into your CSS file directly like we just did when we downloaded the file. So this would be another way to do this. Um, I find that whether you're putting these links into the head or the CSS, I don't really see a huge, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, behavioral difference, or I, I don't think it slows up your app that much, whether you put it into the head or into your CSS, but just know that you have two ways to do this. Um, cool. So Zach is going to paste that link. It's pretty user friendly. Just paste it directly into the head of our HTML. 
And then Google's even nicely, uh, it even gives you the exact code, the font uh, family to put on a particular selector or the rule in your CSS. That's awesome. So uh, Zach, why don't we create, um, why don't we create like, a, like an H2 or an H1 just so sure. we'll have both different fonts to take a look at. How easy is that? Yeah, maybe put in like I am the Google font or something just to be very explicit. That's probably better. The good thing about Google fonts, again, they're free, they're open source, so that's a huge advantage. Cool. So it looks like we implemented the Open Sans Condensed uh, directly into our into our app. Um, Zach, let's let's take a look at one more thing before we kind of get into sure. exercise time. If you don't mind going back to the Google Fonts page, so I mentioned that it gives you kind of a gauge of how um, how expensive this is going to be if you put it into your app. How much slower is it going to make the download uh, time and such? So let's uh, go back to that main page, Zach. And click on, so if you hover right kind of at the bottom of one of those windows, you should see something that says a C specimen. So if you, like right in the bottom right hand of that window, it should pop up Here. and hover. Do you see something that says C specimen? Ugh. Maybe make, um, make your browser a little bit wider. So maybe we get like three on the screen. And the, okay, there you go. Yeah. There it is. So click on that. And so this just gives you a little bit more um, kind of specifics on this specific font. And if you scroll down, so it shows you what each character looks like, which is super helpful. Um, and if you scroll down on the right hand side down here, uh, you can also play around with what the different, um, you know, bold, regular italics, like what they look like. But if you scroll down a little bit more, there should be a gauge. Uh, Sorry, a little bit more. Where is that thing? Maybe that font doesn't have it. Should I try a different one? Mm, maybe they moved it. Um, you know what, I'll find it during ex exercise time. It's no big deal. But okay. I just wanted to demonstrate. It, it's really cool. So it shows you like how expensive this font is gonna be on your download time, um, just if you're curious. But I can look that up during uh, during exercise period. Uh, cool, Zach, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Let's give Zach a big hand. Uh. And let's move forward to a little bit of exercise and you guys go to Google Fonts and implement one yourself. So it'll take five or six minutes to do this. Hit me up if you have any questions. Actually hit Zach up because he's running the show now, so. And then give me a thumbs up once you implement a Google font of your choosing. And if you want to play around with it, I would ask you to take particular note of the URL in that link tag. It's really easy just to add, just to manipulate that link tag to bring in like extra fonts. So if you want to bring in like the bold font and like a skinny font or different varieties, you can get the URLs from Google fonts or you can quickly like just add the extra font um, varieties directly into that URL. And I think once you play around with Google Fonts a little bit, you get a little bit more savvy at that. It's a little bit more intuitive. Doesn't it look like you can have multiples on your CSS page defined in the font face definition. Yeah, that's a, so that, that is a good point. So that may be an advantage to using the link tag in that example, yeah. But usually you can just, um, depending on the font, I feel like you can just put a comma into the URL or you can put a plus and then add the extra um, varieties of that font. Of course, Google will do that for you if you tell it to, but um, you know, sometimes it's really quick just to manipulate it manually. <clears throat> yeah, so Jason says, it looks like you can make the font italic and change the size, but you can't change the weight unless you import the specific weight you wanna use. Yeah, so that's a good tip. Um, 
And some of the fonts may have like four different options. Others may have 10. Uh, it really depends. All right, let's take another uh, minute or so. So we got eight thumbs ups. Adam, the uh, the Giphy font you put into the Party Time channel, that's pretty cool. Have you have you used that before? Con Candy? Uh, well, in the Party Time channel, it's like there's a... Sorry, uh, Adam Youngblood, my bad. The Ma, 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 Madita font? Where's Adam Youngblood? Anyway. Came. It came just like random when I just did the Giphy. I oh, kind of cool. like it though. I might try to yeah. get that down. It's nice. That's really cool. Cool. 12 thumbs up. Let's take another few seconds. All right, um, so I'm gonna move forward. Looks like we have 16 thumbs ups. So this is a really cool, cool CSS feature. Um, I wish I knew about sprites a long time ago. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about sprites and what they are. And to demonstrate this, I want to show you guys an app that I built uh, earlier this year. If you wanna click on that, I'm gonna share my screen and kind of visually demonstrate like what a Slack, uh, excuse me, what a sprite does or what it is. Um, I try, uh, time permitting, I try to build an app along with you guys as you go through uh, for each project. So this is one that I did earlier in the year. And I'm going to share my screen. And the other reason I'm showing you guys this is because maybe you guys already do this, but I keep like a bucket list, if you will, of like one-off little technologies or libraries things that I hear about, frameworks, any cool little thing that I want to dip my toe into, I keep a list. And for the longest time, one of the things on that list was investigating CSS sprites. So I've been looking for some reason to build something with sprites so I could get smarter on it. And I don't know if you guys watch Pressure Luck or whatever, but I was watching like the Game Show Network, and it's a fun game from like the late 70s, early 80s. Um, there's a really interesting article. One guy actually memorized this board and won a ton of money because he memorized the patterns. Probably had a lot of spare time on his hands. Um, anyway, but I use this app. There's a lot of bugs in this app. The whole reason I built this was only to play around with sprites. So I would encourage you guys, um, you know, don't be afraid to like just build something really quick and janky just to play around with one small technology, right? So don't be afraid to, you know, play around with new stuff. Um, but let me show you this app. So if I click on this red button, it starts the pressure luck game board, you know, moving. So there's probably 20 or 30, I forget how many, 20 or 30 individual uh, little images in these boxes, right? It would get really expensive for this app if I had to import or download, you know, 30 different images every time someone opened up this app, it would get really expensive. But the idea with CSS sprites is, what if I give you one image that has each of those individual images on that one big sheet? 
And what if you use CSS, almost like a little window, and you tell the application, only show this part of the sheet for each different area. Um, that's kind of the idea of sprites, and that's what we're gonna take a look at. So I can hit stop, and I hit a whammy. I need to add some sound to this. That's like one of my next steps. And you get three spins. Um, it's pretty fun. But there, yeah, there's a ton of bugs in here. But here's what I wanted to show you guys. I'm gonna go into inspecting my dev tools. I'm gonna go to network or sources. I think we can find it in sources here. So if I go, there's the logo. And here's the board. So this is one image that has all of the different varieties of you know, uh, little images that this board can stop on. And it's all in one sheet. So hopefully you can appreciate that it's much easier and less expensive to download one huge image and let my browser using CSS kind of slice it up once it's downloaded. So it's gonna grab all these images from this one sheet. And it's a really um, efficient way to put images and graphics into your application. So sprites are pretty, pretty awesome. So if you guys want to break my app at some point, I'd appreciate uh, any feedback that you have because I, I need to clean it up. But let's get into sprites. Um, I wanted to show you guys, let me stop my screen share just for a moment. Let me show you guys one other way to visualize this. Um, and this is what we're going to do kind of for exercise time. Hopefully this will translate over the video. But let's say that... Let's say that I have a huge, let me see. The way the sprites work is here's just like some brochure of Atlanta or something. It's got a map, it's got a lot of images on it. So much like that pressure luck example, let's say that I have this huge one uh, style, uh, excuse me, one image, this huge image, and it has a bunch of different individual images that I want to use on my page. So again, instead of downloading like each, you know, 20 different images, what I'm going to do essentially, what we're going to do is let's pretend that this janky piece of paper with the hole cut in it, let's pretend that this is our HTML, okay? And we're going to create a little window using HTML and CSS. And so let's say that somewhere in our HTML, we want to have a window and I want to have like whatever image this is, this bridal image. Let's say that I want that to be visible on my page. So we'll create some CSS to position this thing so it'll move right behind the window. And we'll use top and left and right and some XY positioning. And then I can use that same image, let's say somewhere else on my page, I want, um, I don't know, whatever the heck this thing is, whatever this area is, it doesn't really matter. But I'm just gonna move this one background image, I'm gonna move it around and we're gonna have the part that I want to be visible through the window, I'm gonna position it so you, know, you can only see that part. But I'm still using the same, like, the same one image to get all of my other images out of. Um, so that's kind of the idea, I can't fold these things up. So that's what we're gonna do with CSS sprites. Again, it's much more efficient because making individual HTTP requests for 20, 30 images, it's gonna get really expensive and it's gonna make your application slower versus just downloading one image that you can use CSS to get really surgical and precise with. There's also a link in here. There's a couple of these online. I'll put this into Slack. Uh, we're gonna see in a second, sometimes this is more an art than a science. I know when I was trying to craft, I was just learning uh, CSS sprites. And when I was trying to figure out the exact coordinates on that image for each individual square, um, it was a little frustrating in the beginning because you have to you know, kind of play around with it, position it. Um, the, the dev tools in Chrome came in really handy because I could you know, move it over by one PX or two PX, you know, left, right, up and down to really find the dimensions of that image. But there are websites that can help you find the dimensions and the coordinates for images one of them is called Sprite Cow. I put that into Slack if you wanna check that out later. Um, but you can upload an image and then kind of put a square over the different sections of that image and it will tell you the CSS coordinates so it'll make your life a little bit easier. Eventually, you know, you get a little bit of practice and, and it get, does get a little easier to do this longhand, but um, if you wanna use a site like that, it'll, it'll be helpful.
So I'm going to walk through an example and then I'm going to give you guys uh, a chance to use the same image and just kind of move it around a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a tag with a background image URL, background position of X, background position of Y, and then a width and a height. So the width and the height are going to pertain to the HTML, kind of the window. And then the background position X, background position Y, I'm going to tell that background image exactly, you know, the coordinates for that window behind the HTML. Let's just do it um, instead of me trying to describe it. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen again, and let's take a look at an example of this. So I'm going to share my Atom again. And the first thing I'm going to do is create, in the HTML, kind of create my little window here. I'm going to create a class. I'm going to call this uh, Sprite. So again, this is going to be, you know, the little kind of HTML window that I'm going to put the image uh, behind. And I think what I'm going to do for this one, I'm going to try this. So I'm actually going to put... This may be a little bit of a simpler way to do it. I'm going to put the image directly here within this div, and then I'm going to make some adjustments in my CSS to only show the parts that I want to show. For this example, I'm going to use, let me drag an image into my, into my pipeline here, and I'll send you guys this image as well. So give me one second, let me drag it over here. Kind of a sample style sheet. I'll drag it into my images folder. And then this is the sprite sheet I'm gonna use. This actually has some really tiny icons on it. So sprites are really handy for icons if you want something other than, um, you know, there's little like envelopes for emails or arrows. Um, and you see these all over, you know, Facebook and other websites. I'm just going to use this sheet for an example. So here in the image, I'm actually going to load this image directly. So that's going to be in my images folder. And then it's called example sprite sheet. And I'm going to send you guys this sprite sheet as well. PNG. Did I get that right? Yeah, example sprite sheet PMG. Let me refresh here. See if that loads. Okay, I think I need to fix my path. Let me refresh. Okay, cool. So now we have that entire image loaded, but again, I, I want to create a little window because I only want to see one image, uh, one icon on this main image. So to kind of get really surgical with this, I'm going to go into my CSS. And let's add some rules to that sprite class, to that div. So down here, I'll create a sprite. Sprite's my selector. We're going to create a rule for this. So first, let me put a position of relative here. And then make a width of 20px. And this is just because I know that these images are about 20px by 20px. So those are the dimensions I want to give. And then this is really key. This overflow hidden property is really like kind of the kicker that makes this thing work. So other than what's showing in that window, I'm making everything else hidden. So all the overflow for this image I'm not going to be able to see it. That's really one of the like most important properties when you're building this sprite is making sure you have that overflow hidden. So let me refresh this. Cool. So I can't really see much right there. Yeah, it's kind of an empty space. So that created the window. Now let's work on positioning that, that image behind that window. So to do that, I'm going to add some rules to my image itself. So I put this image in an image tag. 
So let's create an image rule. Now, obviously, if you were putting like multiple images, you'd want to like maybe put a class on this image or something to make it really specific. But for right now, I'm going to put a top of 22px and I'm going to do a left of negative 25px. So these, this rule is going to position that image, like kind of position it behind that little window so we can see a very specific icon. And then for this, I'm going to do a position absolute. So let me refresh here. And there we go. So out of that entire, I mean, there's probably like, I don't know, like 100, 150 icons on there. But I just grabbed this smiley face. So that role that I just created, I'm actually grabbing the first, the, the top um, left hand icon right there. So for your exercise, again, I'm going to send you that PNG. And I want you guys to play around and see if you can pick another icon in this sheet other than that smiley face and play around with that positioning because sometimes it can get a little, a little tricky, a little bit of trial and error. So let me select out your to do instructions here. I'll also select out that code and I'm going to stop my screen share and see if you guys have any questions about that. So I've been doing a lot of talking. Let me stop my share. So I just slacked out some three steps for the exercise. Uh, so you'll first want to create a block element with the specific width and height, which is what I did in my example. Then in your CSS for that element, you'll need to set the background image. So just like I did, I would, um, for this exercise, put the image directly into the HTML. And I'll slack out my code as well, if that's helpful. And then number three, play around with the CSS properties, height, width, background position. Now I did, actually I didn't even use background position X and background position Y for my example. So you may not even need it. You can just use top and left. Um, but if you copy that URL from the example, I'll slack it out just so you can see it specifically. That URL links to the style sheet excuse me, links to the image that I just used with all those icons. So you can just paste that URL into your CSS to get started. So you don't have to like download it locally. And then let me slack out my HTML code for reference. So I'm going to select out my CSS and my HTML, and hopefully that'll be helpful for you guys. So there you go. So there's my the HTML for my image element, and then my CSS. I just put that into Slack. So let's take you know again another uh, five or six minutes. Play around, uh, see if you can you know grab another icon and make that visible on your page. Uh, yes, someone has a question. Um, yeah, in the markdown it says in your CSS for that element set background image to URL, so on and so forth. I don't see that in what you sent out. So was that question for Tom? Oh, uh, sorry, Mark. Sorry, go ahead. So in the instructions it says which? In your um, number two of the last stuff in your CSS for that element, so I made a div element set background image to this. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to do that. If you want to do uh, what I did with my HTML, um, yeah, I see. So the, so the background image in the instruction is if you wanted to put it into the CSS. You could do that if you wanted. Um, but if you want to do it like my HTML, just do it like I did there in Slack. So for the source, for the SRC, they're in quotes. You could literally just put in the link to that image and it should work fine. But yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good catch. D does everyone understand? Um, what Adam was, was suggesting there. I'll, I'll put this in the Slack to make it a little, little clearer. That, that's a good catch.
Yeah, sprites are sprites can be a little bit a little bit tricky for sure um, to get the hang of it. I spent uh, I spent quite a little bit of time uh, getting all those images and my goofy pressure lug thing working. So if you want to include your image, uh, your background image using CSS, you can create a div and then use the background image property on that div. If you want to insert it directly into your HTML, like in my example, you can do this. Yeah, there we go. So if you want to insert it directly into the HTML, you could put it on an image tag like so. So Aaron says, I use your code, but mine shows the whole image. Okay. So we probably need to do some CSS -E, um, adjustments. Aaron, do you want to share your screen? We can take a look. Other folks may be having that issue. Sure. Okay. And if you do get this working, if you don't mind, go ahead and give me a thumbs up in Slack when you get it working. And then after, um, after this, we'll, we'll take a little bit of break before we hop into the uh, response to design. So if you do finish and you want to go ahead and stretch your legs, please feel free. Um, Okay, cool. Sorry, uh, go ahead, Aaron. So here's the, um, I think, I'm pretty sure this is the same as your code here. Okay. Here I have a div with the sprite class and the image source. And on my page, it just loads up the image, uh, you know, the whole image. And because it's absolute, it covers up the text that I have uh, above it. Yeah, <coughs> let's see. Images. So it is loading okay. What are we missing here? Um, in your CSS, like on line five through seven, go ahead and get rid of that body tag. I don't, uh, the body rule, I don't think that's doing anything, but just to be safe. So you got Sprite. It looks like, so you misspelled, well, so take a look at line 17 in your CSS. Oh, position. That, that's another thing I wish Adam and Sublime Text had was spell check. <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't, you know, sometimes um, when we write our lessons, you know, which is in README, uh, sometimes there's a lot of misspellings because it doesn't have spell check. Uh, I wish it had that. But cool. So is that working now, Aaron? Works now. Cool. <laughs> so let me give you kind of a, a good use case for when sprites may come in handy. Um, for example, for your project one, uh, which we'll talk about on Monday afternoon, but probably one of your project choices is gonna be uh, creating a blackjack game. And we'll give you some you know, special requirements and such. Any blackjack fans out there? Any degenerates like me? Okay, cool. So uh, sprites would come in really handy because you can get one image that has all 52 cards, right? How cool is that? So you have one image and then you can use some positioning to, um, you know, for, for all the cards, it's going to be huge. So if you're really interested in sprites, project one will be a great opportunity to kind of exercise that, that skill. So we got eight thumbs ups. Yeah. Hey Mark, can I share, uh, share my screen? Yeah. All right, cool. I'm doing and the I'll CSS background thing and it's not working and I'm losing my mind. Okay. So this is where I got in CSS, and this is what I have um, here. And this is my stuff. Okay, give me one sec. Okay, so we've got 
div class sprite. Um, so one, so one thing is when you're putting a background image in via a style sheet, you need to designate the width and height uh, of the image because right now the the if you look if you inspected the element, the image is actually loading, but it it doesn't know the the dimensions. So on the sprite class, yeah, that's where you want to. Um, to do that. Oh, yeah. And for those of you, if you're if you're struggling with like moving that sheet around, I'll give you a little bit of a pointer because I've struggled with it. If you each icon is just about 30 px away. So, for example, in the code that I sent you, um, for example, I put image top as 22 negative 22 px and left as negative 25 px. So if you add negative 30 to those two um, to those two values, it should, you know, in most cases, uh, you need to play around with it. But about 30 px is what will move everything either left, right, or top, bottom, because um, I think the window, the images are about 30 px. You may need to like move it over a px or two, but. Cool. So we got 12 thumbs ups. Um, yeah, so uh, let's take a little bit of a break. Uh, let's come back at 12.40 p.m. and we're gonna hop into some responsive design before lunch. So go ahead and take a break. Uh, if you're still working, I'll, I'll be here if you need any help, but we'll come back at 12.40. Hey, Mark, my yeah. image isn't even showing up in here. Okay. Do you Maybe want- Just a little icon here, I'll show you. Sure. I'm getting this. Okay. I just did your example. Um, here, let me split my screen so you can see both. Uh, so the reason, so on line 14, the reason that you're getting that error is because you're using a link. You're trying to find that image in your images folder, um, which you could do that, but I actually, just to make it easier, I just went ahead and selected out the HTTP, like the link. So if you go to Slack and you paste in the actual link, um, that should be I helpful. just did that. I'm sorry. That's I, right. Here, that's what I had. And then whenever I refresh my page, here's nothing. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Um, do, do this for me. Uh, undo that and go back to that relative path that you had. Okay, so save that, go into your Chrome browser and open up that image in a, in a new tab. So if you just paste in that HTTP. Yeah, cool. So let's just see if we can, let's just download it and see if it'll work if we put it into your app. All right. And I think you have an extra like ending quote there you want to get rid of. Oh, and the... Yeah. Okay. You just so, save as. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and then um, go into that folder. So you see that little arrow right to the right of that save as input box? See a little down arrow? Yeah, mm -hmm. click on that and that'll give you some more options here. So let's maneuver to your correct, uh, um, so you should be doing this in like student labs. So let's go into okay. your, oh yeah. Yeah. Right there. Cool. I want that in my, Yes. Uh, I think fonts lesson isn't that where Font, we're? Yeah, yeah. fonts lesson and then images. And then images, yeah. And do, ah. do me a favor before you save that. Before you save that, go mm -hmm. up to your save as at the top. Yeah. So even though this is a PNG, it's not going to put dot PNG at the end of your extension. So go ahead and okay. dot PNG just to be redundant and save that. Cool. And then go back and refresh your um, your page. Uh, okay. 
had too many mine is up here on what's what there we go okay let's check your console let's see if you're getting any errors in the browser so go into your dev tools and let's check your console okay you're not getting any errors that's good go down into your sources tab open up your images folder okay click on that okay that's fine so we must have something misspelled somewhere so go back to Adam let's take a look oh, that, that. Look on, okay, go into your styles.css at the end of line 28. Is that a colon or a semicolon at the end of that line? Oh my gosh. Yes, it's a colon. Yeah. Wow. You and I, I, so <laughs> I, I know that because line 29, the word position was grayed out. So that visually led me to look there because Adam was telling me something is not cool. I saw that. I was like, why is that position absolutely different from yeah. my position relative? Okay. Yeah. So go ahead and, um, there cool. we go. Oh my gosh, is this semi Very nice. Full time. The yeah, link yeah. probably would have worked just as well. Yeah. And, and nine times out of ten, that's usually it's something really goofy and small like that. So <laughs> no, no problem. Right on. Thank you. Cool. Good work. Uh, Mark, I got a yeah. question. Can I speak chair? Yeah. All right. Go for it. Uh, no, that's not it. Um, so this is my stuff. Um, this is the sprite that this is what the sprite cow is telling me to do. I have it like that minus 265, minus 204 PX, um, with height do i again have to give it a certain width and height but i thought this is the width and height so i'm wondering why is uh go back to you so it's not rendering at all are you getting no. if you go back into your dev tools uh again what we just did with brad let's just make sure that the image is loading so we'll, we'll try to debug this a little bit um oh sorry you're doing this via the url go to network network and uh, just reload the page. Okay. Um, so that's a actually click on all. I'll do it. And let's see if we're getting that. Scroll down. Okay, that very bottom one says that it's a font, but I wonder. Click on that. Yeah, that is the font. Okay, so it looks like it's not. Um, do me a favor. Uh, pull up your um, your atom. Just a little bit higher. Okay. Because people's faces are, are cutting that off a little bit. Sorry, uh, the, the entire window, because I can't see the bottom of your Adam window. Sorry, <laughs> literally the bottom of your Adam window, I can't see the bottom of it. So if you could like pull the bottom up of your Adam window. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Right. Uh, cool. Yeah. All right. So let's see what's going on here. Um, Go to your uh, index. Let's just make sure that that's cool. You got your div class sprite. Okay. Um, and then let's check your CSS when I scroll down. So sprite background image, width, height, no repeat. Okay. So let's, um, uh, get rid of that no repeat for a second or just comment that out. I don't know if you can comment it out. It may comment out the whole thing, but. Let's get rid of that for the moment. And go ahead and get rid of the dimensions right there too. And put it some, yeah. Uh, let's do a width and height of like 200 by 200. Let's just make sure that that thing's rendering correctly. Okay, save that and then let's go back and refresh. Okay, so we are getting it, so that's good. Um, so what, what I would do since you're trying to load it in through the, uh, through CSS, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to make an outer container around, um, actually, I think what you may want to do is go into your HTML and maybe put a div inside your Sprite class. 
in your HTML. So I, I think you'd want to. But the way I did it wasn't wrong. It's just for some magical reason, it's not working. Correct? Yeah, no, no, it, it, it is not wrong. It's not you. It's just that we would need to uh, slightly alter some of the CSS rules. Because right now the sprite is rendering. What you need to do is you need to, um, you know, uh, you need to put a div over it that's, a, you know, like a 30 by 30 and then have that sprite behind it and you need to tell that div in front of it, hey, overflow hidden. So that sprite will be maneuvering behind it and then you do the dimensions of the sprite. So only, you know, the icon that you want is visible through that window. Um, Why is that not in the instructions? Because we did it, like I mentioned, my bad. <laughs> I put that into Slack. The way that I demonstrated it is when we just put the two divs into HTML. That was oh, just- yes, No, no, I, I don't mean it like that. Sorry, no, I, I don't mean, I mean like the, the way that's in the instructions, like, you know, these are two different ways to do it. I'm wondering why those instructions don't have it this way. Is this like a workaround we're doing? Uh, no, it's not a workaround. There's just, I mean, there's several ways to put a sprite into your page. So um, I got to put a mini div inside of this div or a, a bigger div around this div? I would put the bigger div around that div. Okay. And because essentially if you look at, um, if you look at my version in Slack, what I did is I created a div called Sprite and then within that div, that's where I inserted my image. But I inserted the image directly into the HTML and that's fine. You're doing it a different way and that's fine. So but you're, in, you're inserting the image via CSS on that uh, class sprite div. So if you want to do it like we demoed it, just make a div around that. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, it's tomato tomato. I mean, you could do it either way, right? And then and then what should I do? Um, you'll need to put a class on that div on nineteen. And then, Adam, I'm gonna. We need to take this offline because we need to move forward. Um, oh, sorry. I, I'm, I thought I'm happy to. Was still happening. My apologies. No, no, it's yeah. cool. I'm ha I'm happy to. Uh, I'm happy to walk through it for sure. Um, but with most of the CSS stuff, again, it's it's very much an art versus a science. There's several ways to insert sprites. There's several ways to do all this stuff. Actually, um, I just kind of chose the path of least resistance this morning. But I'll, I'll update that lesson because I put background image, and um, that wasn't exactly what I demoed. So I'll update that. I hope that wasn't too confusing for, for the other folks. Um, cool. So give me, I need 30 seconds. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be right back. Let me take a 30 second break. I'll be right back guys. All right. Um, yeah, so Adam, let's, uh, let's go through the responsive design portion. And then before lunch, if we have a few minutes, I'm happy. I can sh share my screen and I'll build it the way that you're building it. 
using background image and CSS. Um, so we can totally do that if you want. Let me see how many thumbs up we had. So did anyone, so we had 13 folks that got the sprite working. Did anyone else hit, uh, who didn't get the sprite working? Anyone? I should probably ask the opposite if you don't want to raise your hand. So Dana looks like we didn't get it working. So let's do this. Let's move forward to the responsive design portion. And then um, before lunch, I'll try to carve out some time and we'll go back and I'm happy to uh, take a look at your stuff. And I'll also build a version of the Sprite using Adam's uh, approach. So we can totally do that. But hopefully you guys see the value in Sprites. They're just, they're pretty fun and awesome. And they're a huge, um, if you're using a lot of images, it's a really, really great way to make your app run faster. Okay, uh, I'm gonna slack out the next readme that we're gonna go through. So let's talk a little bit about responsive design. Now, I'm going to guess that most of you fine folks, you know, you may wanna use Bootstrap or some other front-end library to make your stuff really nice and responsive, and that's totally cool. Um, in fact, in most cases, that would probably be the best strategy. Monday morning, we're gonna talk about <clears throat> something called Flexbox, which not only makes your stuff responsive and very nice and neat horizontally, but it also makes your stuff really nice and neat, verti uh, nice and neat uh, vertically. But we're gonna take a look at that Monday morning. That's another really cool strategy for um, nice responsive design. Well, let's take a look at using responsive design kind of longhand if you want to build it. It's really good to know how this stuff works underneath the hood, even if you're going to use some other type of library. And here are our goals uh, here before lunch. So we want to explain responsiveness and why we need it. We'll talk about fluid layout, describe the mobile first development process. You guys have probably heard these you know, terms before. We're gonna take a look at min and max height and width. And then we're gonna talk about media queries and why we need them. So again, most of you guys have probably played with this stuff or you know, have heard of this stuff before. Some of this may have even been in the, the fundamentals, the pre-work. And we're just gonna take another peek at this. So to start, a little bit of backstory on responsive design. So the phone, tablet, phablet, iPhone watch wars. Um, so Apple, Google, and Samsung, and a bunch of other companies all released a bunch of devices with various dimensions. Initially, we needed to test to determine which device was viewing the site and then serve up different content based on that. It was called adaptive design. So you could put meta tags and such into your HTML. Um, also, when your server gets a response, it passes some information on the viewport or what type of device that that user is currently requesting your site from. And so that's a way that the server can then decide, oh, let me send them an iPhone version of the site or a desktop version of the site. And back in the day, really large companies had the bandwidth and the, um, the cash flow. Uh, I, uh, way back in the day, I worked at Disney Interactive for a little bit. And th this was years ago, and this was right at the beginning of kind of um, responsive design. They actually had two different teams. They had a team that would build like a desktop version of, you know, the site, um, a team that would work on like an Android version. You know, obviously a company like Disney has the funds to afford those different teams. But as more devices came into fruition on planet Earth, it got really expensive to afford. I mean, there's very few companies, if any, that can afford teams for every single device that exists out there. Um, in my previous role, uh, before I took WDI, I built a lot of, um, the company that I worked for, I built a lot of HTML emails for marketing campaigns um, and would design these campaigns. And frequently, I, I forget the name of the technology, but we had a subscription service that would have, you would load up your file or your email and it would show you what that looks like on maybe 80 different varieties of devices and combinations of devices. So not only Gmail versus like MSN versus, uh, you know, Hotmail, I don't know, whatever, a few years back, um, 
not only the email server, but also the device, right? So Opera, Internet Explorer, all 20 versions of Internet Explorer. And it was such a pain because obviously there's not a magic bullet in most cases. Like you can't build a site that's going to be absolutely perfect for every browser and device. Although nowadays we're getting much, much better at that. And one of those appro approaches is responsive design and mobile first. And put in kind of where we are currently. So nowadays, so soon there were too many devices to examine and to write code for, right? If we had to write code for 80 different varieties of devices, it would just be insane. So we decided to serve the same content to all devices, but modify the content slightly so that it still looks good on any device. And this is called responsive design, making your application responsive to whatever situation it may find itself in. So in response to design, the content responds to width, height, orientation, meaning portrait or landscape, however you have the device positioned, and then media. Now, a couple of the methods to achieve this, we're just going to look at a couple of the main ones. Using fluid layout, using a mobile first strategy, which we're going to talk about here shortly. Uh, using min and max height and width, particularly with things like nav bars, <clears throat> that comes in really handy. Uh, and then media queries are a huge, um, a great tool to make your site responsive. Also, the Chrome DevTools device toolbar. So I don't know if you guys have noticed or if we talked about it, but if you go into your DevTools, there should be maybe, let me see where it is, um, maybe two or three little icons over. Actually, it's one icon over from the inspect element icon. So you guys should see like a toggle device toolbar. So you guys should see that kind of on the left hand side. It looks like two little devices. If you click on that, it gives you maybe eight or nine uh, device viewports. So you can very quickly see what your site would look like on, you know, an iPhone plus, um, an iPad, an Android, you know, some of the, like the most popular devices nowadays. So that's actually built into DevTools, and that's only been in existence for maybe, you know, one and a half, two years. Um, but it's super handy, and it's a really quick and dirty way to see what your site looks like on some of the most popular devices. It's a, it's a really great tool. Now, what is mobile first? Has anyone heard of mobile first before? Or maybe if you've worked at a company and you've heard that nomenclature thrown around. Um, Tom, actually, I haven't heard from you in a bit. I uh, saw you raise your hand. Would you want to uh, come on mic and kind of give us an explanation of mobile first? The way I understand it <coughs> is that um, instead of designing for PCs like towers and laptops, etc., you're really designing for uh, phones first and foremost, and then sort of as not as an afterthought, but as sort of a second design goal, making it look good on PCs, laptops, et cetera. Yeah, that, that's an excellent explanation. So basically, instead of building like a desktop version of our site and then trying to cram that content into like a smaller viewport, let's take a mobile first strategy. Let's make sure that this site looks really good on very small devices because it's easier to build something out than it is to condense it. So mobile first is just starting with like a mobile uh, user in mind and then kind of building stuff out appropriately. Yeah, thanks for that. So uh, min, max, height, and width, which is what we're going to be playing around with here momentarily. Um, these are really handy, particularly like for nav bars. If you want to keep item text on one line, for example. And then sometimes you can combine the min width and height with percentages. So we saw that earlier in the week with that calc, the CSS property, where you can combine, um, maybe you have an image that's a set uh, width, like with a PX, but maybe you want some other content to be a percentage of the viewport or something. Um, so min and max height and width is also, uh, you can also configure it with different types of measurement, percentages with pixels, things like that. All right, uh, let's take a look at media queries and then we will do a code along. So media queries, uh, you guys are probably 
maybe have heard of this before. Was this in your pre-work, by the way, media queries? Oh, yeah, I, I was pretty sure it was. Media queries are, are pretty awesome. Um, so some of the possibilities for media queries, you can define different views or different versions of your app and content for desktop, for print, for TV, for example. Um, that was kind of how media queries originated. Some of the features are listed here, uh, min and max width, min and max height, orientation, again, that landscape versus portrait. Uh, resolutions, that's really important, right? We have all different types of screens, um, 4K, you know, 1080p, even less. So uh, considering resolution sometimes is a good call. Mobile first with media queries. So consider that mobile devices are usually slower, right? The CPUs in a, in a device is usually, it usually isn't as up to date or as fast as a laptop or a desktop um, machine. Although I think the iPhone that was released yesterday, the A10 is supposed to be pretty, pretty fast. Uh, but mobile will read mobile CSS and discard, sorry, media queries will kind of partition the rules so that a, media, a, a mobile device will only read the mobile CSS rules and ignore the larger rules. A desktop will look at the desktop rules and ignore the mobile rules. So it's a great way to sort of partition um, and segregate your rules based on the device. So it makes it a little bit more efficient. Um, could also have media queries for small devices. Uh, that's fine, but it can get a little complex with a lot of media queries because you have less, uh, less real estate to deal with with a media device. And you couple that with the slower nature of media uh, of mobile devices. And so if you put too much CSS in there, you know, it could affect the performance of your application. What we're doing today, we don't really need to, to deal with that. Um, okay, cool. Let's get to it. Let's actually build some of this stuff. So we're going to do a little bit of a code along. I'll be slacking out some code as we go through this. And then this afternoon for lab time, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a choose your own adventure. So I have some different exercises. If you want to play with sprites, I have some exercise for that. If you want to play with responsive design, I have some stuff for that. If you want to play with fonts, you can get some exercise with that. So just wanted to give you guys um, an opportunity to play with any of these that are really, you know, kind of tickle your fancy this afternoon. But to start, let's do a code along on responsive design. And we are going to use the uh, same index.html and style sheet that we used for the fonts that, that we already have open. We're just going to use the same, these same files. That'll be fine. Uh, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And I'll be putting this code into Slack um, just in case you guys need it. And go ahead and if you, you know, if you want to like even start going forward based on those steps, feel free, but I'm going to walk through them. So the first thing we're going to do, step one, let's create a div with some content inside it. That for large width screens for like a desktop or like some sort of external browser, it's going to have a width of 300 PX and it's going to be centered in the middle of the page. So let's get that working first. It's actually a little counterintuitive for mobile first. We're actually going to build something. Uh, step one, we're going to make something large, but for this exercise, it'll be okay. Um, so if you're watching my screen, uh, just down here under like the sprite and this earlier stuff, I'm going to create a div. I'll give this uh, a class of, um, uh, I'll just say um, box. box one actually, in case we add some more boxes. And inside here, I'm gonna do my, I'm not gonna do lorem ipsum, that's probably a little overkill for this. Let me do content, um, like box one content. Let me refresh here. Cool, so we should just see like kind of a janky little, little example there. So now let's add some rules to this. 
uh, box so that for a large screen, this div specifically is going to be 300 px and it's going to be centered. Um, so it's going to be very fluid depending on the screen size. So to do that, I'm going to go down here into my CSS and let's create some rules to make that happen. So we're playing with our box one class. Actually, I'm going to have someone come on mic and walk me through this. Does anyone want to, I can't see everyone's faces because I'm sharing my screen, um, but does someone want to come on mic if they have a suggestion on how, uh, what these rules should look like to make this uh, box one, we want to make it 300 px and we want to make it fluid, we want to make it centered on our page. Or you can put it into Slack as well if you want to suggest how we would approach this CSS rule. So Aaron's suggesting max width, 300 px. Sure, let's throw that in there. Why not? So we can refresh. Okay, cool. So we're not really seeing anything yet, but that's okay, because we're just setting the width. We can also use values and percentages. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we could use margin zero auto. Cool, any other suggestions? Cool, that's good. Yeah, that's getting a little bit better. I am going to, again, just so we can like actually see this thing, I'm gonna put uh, like a background of yellow just to help us see it. Okay, cool. So yeah, it looks like that's about 300 px. I'm gonna go ahead and like text align center just to kind of make this visually a little bit more centered looking. Cool, so that looks pretty good. So as I stretch out the screen, yeah, it looks like for the most part it's pretty nice and centered, so that's great. It's staying nice and fluid there in the middle. Very nice. Sean is suggesting make it badass on phone 100%. So maybe what type of phone would be my next, uh, my next question. But yeah, we're going to make this responsive for smaller screens here next. Cool. So uh, any more suggestions about the step one? This actually looks pretty good. Um, so it's great actually to satisfy kind of the first, first step. All right, uh, so let's move on to step two. So for screens that have a width of less than 500 px, we want this div to fill 100% of the screen. So how could we accomplish that? This is actually when media queries are gonna come into play. Now we haven't like seen an example in the lesson yet, so we're gonna build one now. But if anyone's pretty slick on their media queries, does someone want to suggest some code that we could put into our CSS, uh, perhaps a rule, using a media query. Again, for screens that have a width of less than 500 px, we want that yellow div to fill 100% of the screen or the viewport. So Jason is suggesting at media query 500 px. Yeah, so that's, I mean, pretty much the start here, right? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna hit enter a couple of times here just so we can kind of get some more real estate. Yeah, so let's go ahead and start our media query. So that's gonna look like so. Let's do an at media, and I'm gonna do a max width of 500 px. So essentially, anything under or less than 500 px, this media query rule is going to apply. It's gonna kick in. So we created this outer media query, and then inside it, um, yeah, let's put something on box one. 
because this is the specific div that we're trying to um, adjust with the media query. And then what could we put inside here? What should this media query look like? So again, if it's under 500 px, uh, we want um, we want this box to take up 100% of the of the space. So what could we put in here? There's a couple of things we could put in here actually. While you guys are thinking about that and diligently typing, the one thing that I don't like about this Atom uh, browser, just to kind of like give you guys a heads up, unfortunately there aren't any. Uh, dev tools where well, there are some dev tools but it opens in a separate window and you guys may already be savvy at this but if you open up your dev tools in chrome as long as that dev tools window is open and you resize your browser it will show you the dimensions which is really handy um unfortunately i can't see this here maybe i'll just go ahead and share like my entire screen so we can see that actually let me do that now because that's going to be really helpful so let me show you guys that if you if you don't know what I'm talking about. So let me unshare my screen. Well, let me do a new share. I'm going to share my entire entire area here, and let me open up. Cool. So we have that. So if you open up your Dev Tools, and you guys may already know this. Um, forgive me if I'm being redundant or what have you. As long as your dev tools are open, so if you notice right up here in kind of the top right hand corner of the browser window, it'll show you the dimensions as you, you know, kind of open or, or make the browser different sizes. That's a super handy tool. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned earlier was this toggle device toolbar. So you can click on that and it'll give you a couple of different varieties of, you know, really popular devices where you can see what this will look like. So iPhone Plus, iPhone 5, or just responsive. Anywho. All right, cool. Anyway, back to the show. So Zach suggests width 100%. Uh, we have background cover, and then we have max width 100%. Um, yeah, absolutely. So width would be really good. Actually, I think... I think all of those would work. Um, I'm going to throw a little curveball in here just because we haven't talked a lot about it. I'm going to put width and I'm going to use that VH. I really like using these VH and VW. So remember that VH stands for viewport. Ooh, excuse me, this should be VW. Uh, viewport width and viewport height. So it's it's pretty similar to percentage in that is zero to one hundred but you don't have to put the percent sign. You can do that VW and, and that's the entire width of the viewport. And the viewport width and height are a little bit more powerful because you could use percentages in here, but you could still say like, make this element 100% of this smaller you know, div. Like you could do 100% percentages within other kind of segregated divs. Um, 100% viewport width and height, there's really no arguing. It's just literally going to take over the entire width or height of your viewport. So sometimes I like using that. It's just a little bit more like kind of the nuclear option. And we haven't really used it a lot, so I wanted to throw that in there. All right, the moment of truth. Let's, uh, let me refresh here, and let's shrink down to right around 500. This thing should switch to 100%. So, and it didn't do it. Okay, what are we missing? Hmm. So we may need to adjust a rule or two. So we've got VW width. That's right. What am I missing here? Let me see what happens if I just do like a general div situation here. So we've got max width, margin, background, text center. Oh, I know what I'm missing. We're probably going to have to do a position uh, relative, I think. Let's see if that kind of fixes this. Those silly position rules. All right, so now if we get below 500, wow, still not doing it. Mark, could it be yeah. that in our, in our box one class above, 
yeah. we're, call, we're saying the maximum width it can be is 300 no matter what, and that's overriding it? That could be it, yeah. Because actually, when I did this in rehearsal, I just used width instead of max width. So let's see if just plain old width will do it for us. So that didn't, uh, I'm also, what am I missing here? That works for me. I'm not sure what our code difference oh, is. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, so I've got width. I think you're misspelling width for the media tag, or it should be pixels. I think you have something else in there. 100px, you wrote VW or something? Yeah, so that's for viewport width. Um, oh, okay. sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's cool. Uh, so that actually worked. Uh, I changed it to 100 pixels and mine works. Okay, let's try that out. So we get under 500. Huh. Yeah. Um, so let me, I'm trying, I don't want to like blatantly copy my code from this morning. So I've got width of 300 px. That's right. Margin. The only other thing is that earlier I just used auto instead of zero auto. Okay, that's okay. Um, background yellow, text line center. I didn't have that earlier. Again, not that that, not that that should break anything, but just to be consistent. Okay. I think Mark, if you change the div to dot box again under media. That yeah, it's true. There we go. So it did it did something. It's not it's getting a little bit more responsive, but not exactly what we want. And that's because so now if I change this to VW, it should work. So let's go back to that. Woo! Okay. Yeah, so see how like these it's so funny, like these properties. They're they're very like uh, they're very sensitive, so that's cool. Yeah, so we added a media query. We're on really large screens, i.e. or i.g. Uh, screens that are 501 pips or higher. Uh, the box is going to be centered nicely. It's 300 px wide, and then once we get below 500 px, 500 px or lower, it's going to take up 100% of the viewport. And actually, I think 100% should work there just fine because we don't have a lot of other rules on our divs or border or padding or anything like that. So I think that should that should be fine too. Yeah. So, hey, Mark, can you try use, can you try using the mobile um, the little icon in the yeah. in the dev tool in the browser because mine works in the browser, but not when I click the uh, mobile. Yeah, that is because, so in order for, to make, um, to make the site completely responsive, I think we're going to need to add a meta tag to our HTML, like some sort of viewport. Um, let's do a quick Google on that. I think that will, so we need to tell the HTML to actually like, recognize what type of device we're using. Um, so let's see what that, that viewport tag would look like. You should include the following meta tag in all your web pages. Let's see if this fixes it. Um, if this doesn't, I'll, I'll come back and uh, figure this out in a minute. But I'm going to grab this meta tag. Let me see if this works. If it works, I'll put it into Slack. Um, but now if I refresh, there we go. So this is a really good tip. This is something to keep in mind. If you want um, your site to indeed be, you know, properly responsive for mobile and stuff, particularly if you're using this dev tools, you do need to add this kind of meta tag to your HTML. And so if you look at what I just slacked out, so this actually says this initial scale. So you can adjust this scale. So maybe on mobile, you want it to be like, like slightly bigger than it should be or slightly smaller. <clears throat> so you could configure it. Otherwise on a mobile device, um, it's probably just going to look the way it would on a large screen. So I think we would need both of those, at least here in the dev tools, um, for that to work properly. Let me see if I put this on. So I'd be curious, maybe on iPad. 
Yes, remember, so iPad is actually the width is what, like 640 or 780, I don't know. So on an iPad, it actually does kind of, since it's larger than 500 PX, it does adhere to that main um, non-media query rule. So cool. Yeah, slap that meta tag in the head of your HTML and that should work properly. All right, uh, two more steps before lunchtime. So step four, let's create four divs with content and a yellow background. So let's go into our HTML here. Let's knock out four divs. Copy this. Cool. Um, I just put some like placeholder stuff in here, like div one, div two, two div three, div four. Uh, let's refresh. Cool, some janky looking divs there. Uh, content in a yellow background. So since I used a class on this box, and the box is also a div, I don't want to put rules like on a general div. So let me quickly add a class to each of these. Um, uh, I'm going to call these jank divs. Actually, that should be a dash. So go ahead and like create some sort of class. Again, I'm just doing this because I don't want to put some kind of blanket div rules. Um, otherwise, it's going to affect all of these. And I don't want that to happen. So. Uh, I'm going to put a class called jank divs there. And here, let's put a background. Um, we can do a background of yellow. We'll see if that like interferes with, with the other, if it's too confusing. Background of yellow. <clears throat> Cool, okay, that's fine for now, I think. So go ahead and create those four divs. And then the last step down here, we're gonna play around with these divs. So step four says, for screen widths greater than 600 PX, the divs should line up in a row. So, you know, maybe we could consider this some sort of nav bar or something. They should have a red background and they should have a black 1px solid border. The combined width of all four divs should fill the width of the screen. So now we have a little bit more, you know, some more tricky properties and media queries that we're going to have to play around with. So let's do it, you guys. Um, Yeah, so right now these divs are taking up the entire width of the screen on these large, kind of the large screen devices. Um, I'm going to go ahead, this wasn't in the instructions, but let's go ahead and make these things float. I'm going to do a float right. So let's just pretend that this may be some sort of nav bar. So I'm going to do a float right. Cool, so it looks like garbage right now. We're gonna fix that. But we're gonna just pretend this is a nav situation. So they're floating nice, they're all nice in a row. Okay, cool, so again, the exercise is for screen widths bigger than 600 PX, the divs should line up in a row. So that's what we just did, essentially. We added that float property. I did a float right to make those line up in a row. They should also have a red background when they're greater than 600 px and have a black 1px solid border. So uh, let's create a media query to play around with that. Does anyone want to start us off? What would a media query look like? So right now when it's greater than uh, 600 px, we want them to have a red background and have a black 1px solid border. We could also put that float property in there too. We can move it around. So Zach says, um, media min width 600 PX. Yeah, that looks like a good start. So let's do that. So instead of max width, we're gonna do min width. 
And think if, if someone wouldn't mind, I can't see everyone's faces, but I think someone's unmuted. If you wouldn't mind taking care of biz. Thank you. Yeah, so for this one, let's do a min width and we'll do a 600 PX. And then Zach, I see that you're trying to like put in kind of a code formatting. I think that would be easier. Maybe next time try, or if you want to edit this, maybe try the three back ticks at the beginning and the end. And I think it'll format that code a little better. Um, it's kind of hard to see on my screen, but that may clean up your uh, little code snippet. But it looks great. So yeah, we got media min width 600 px. Yeah, nice, cool. Okay, so I'll go ahead and add this float down there just because that's what the instructions said. So let me refresh and see what's going on here. Oh, I'm such a dumb dumb. I actually need to tell it <laughs> what we're putting this media query on. So we're putting this media query on our janky divs. And this is gonna be kind of our first property and value for that. Cool, so let me refresh. And so now, yeah, so it looks like, so if I get to like 599, yeah, so it goes back to, you know, being block elements and then filling up the entire screen, cool. All right, great, so we've got them floated above 600 PX, minimum width of 600 PX. So uh, yeah, we're on the right track here. Um, we also want them to have a red background and have a black 1px solid border. So what are the other rules we could throw in here? So when this is over 600 px, go ahead and put it into Slack. How would I make the color red once we get over 600 px uh, at a minimum? How could we change the color? Because right now they're yellow. I see some folks typing. Cool, yeah, so let's do a background of red. And we'll throw the border on here as well. 1px black uh, solid. All right, let's see what that looks like. Ooh, it's looking pretty sweet. So yeah, so once we're above 600px, and now if we go down to like 599, yeah. Nice, awesome guys. And then the last thing we wanna do is the combined width of all four of these divs should fill the width of the screen when we're on sizes greater than 600 px. So how can we do that? Because right now they're still pretty small and they're hugging like the right side of the screen. How can we make these fill up the width of the screen in a nice orderly fashion? And let's try to make them fill up the screen. You know, there's four divs, so let's make them kind of nice and equal-like. How could we do that? Well, to get started, there's four divs. So if we want each one to be equal in sizing, maybe we can make each one have a width of, you know, like 25%, right? Cool, so that's closer. But remember that browsers and such, they, they add a little bit of like goofiness depending on the browser um, on each side of of elements or sometimes in the body or the window. So this is indeed 25 PX, but it's not fitting nice and snug. So can you guys remember a strategy or a property that we can use that will kind of force elements to fit within something? It's a property that we, that we played with last week and it'll kind of contain elements within the designated, um, designated size or, or something. I just got a note that you guys have outcomes at 1.30. So let's wrap this up, give you guys a bit of break time. Um, Tom is typing, come on Tom, you can do it. Cirilla is typing, clear fix. Uh, it's not clear fix, yes, Tom has it. 
box sizing border box. I think that that will clean this up for us. So if we put in box sizing border box and we refresh, there we go. So now it's it's making all of those divs fit within the, you know, kind of the 25 percentage for each one. It's forcing them to fit within a hundred percentage uh, width container. Very nice. Jason says outcomes were yesterday. So I know you guys had afternoon. Oh, did you have outcomes at lunch yesterday? Am I getting some bad intel? Um, today's your Thursday lunch groups. Yeah, small okay. groups. Cool, small lunch groups. Oh yeah, I see Seth just put something in there. Okay, cool. Um, all right, great. So I'm gonna slack out this code. Again, we'll have the video. I'm also going to push my entire you know directory up to the repo here shortly, so you'll have that for reference as well. Uh, let me stop my screen share. And any questions before we before we break for lunch? Uh, so your afternoon lab time, you're going to have a chance to play around with this further. But any any quick questions before lunch? So hey, have I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, what did you say? Uh, box sizing does again? Like I see it visually, but I'm just trying to because I never really used it before. So yeah, we talked about that last week. So box sizing, uh, there's different criteria. You're saying, do you want these elements to be a certain width? Um, excluding or including things like padding and content. So if I'm saying an element is, you know, 25% of the screen, is that 25% of just that inner content or is that including the outer padding and margin as well? Uh, let me share my screen quickly and I'll show you that in the box model here in the dev tools. So what the border box does is it's saying, and you can see it right here. So without that border box, we have this extra 1% on each side. That's what was making the, the, um, the divs not line up you know, equally because there was this extra border on each side. What border box is saying is make this entire thing 25% including the border. Otherwise, if we take this off, let me unclick that. So now, while we're saying that the content is 25%, it's also adding in this extra like one PX to the calculation. And so that's why these aren't lining up correctly. And the border box is saying, make each element 25% and include the border box in that, uh, include the border box in that calculation. All right, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no sweat. Cool, uh, great work this morning, you guys. Um, go ahead to outcomes. Sorry if I kept you a little bit late. I didn't realize you had lunch this morning. And we'll see you guys uh, at 2.30 after lunch. So have a great outcome session. Hey, Mark, are you going to slack in your code for the CSS and HTML? Yeah, like yeah. I said, I'm going to slack that out right now. I'm also going to push this entire directory to your repo so you'll have it for reference. Oh, yeah, awesome. I'll, I'll slack this out right now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because I wasn't working for some reason. I was yeah. just looking at yours. Yeah. Yeah, I'll select it out right now. And Mark, you're still recording.